to the webinar, Questioning the Scholarly Integration of Refugee Students Beyond Academia. We are delighted to have all of you here today at this important event. Our webinar is hosted and organized by web to learn for the Agile Project, Higher Education Resilience in Refugee Crisis, Forging Social Inclusion Through Capacity Building, Civic Engagement, and Skills Recognition. And I would like to sincerely thank to uh, the co-organizers of this webinar on behalf of uh, the esteemed web to learn team, Katarina Zhu and Stefania Oikonomo, for the opportunity to be the moderator of this webinar. We are gathered here to delve into the academic and social challenges that refugee students face as they strive to integrate beyond the academic realm. Your focus and our focus will be uh, on exploring uh, the, ro the roles and responsibilities, responsibilities of higher education institutions in supporting the students, acknowledging the constraints these institutions may uh, encounter. To start, I would like to tell you a few words uh, about the Agile project. Uh, the overall goal of our Agile project is to increase the resilience of inclusive higher education institutions in addressing the current needs of refugee through uh, their social participation and skills recognition in their educational pathways. To achieve these goals, I'm sorry, uh, to, uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, in Ukraine, we have some alarm uh, messages, so I'm sorry. Uh, to achieve this goal, we format uh, several specific objectives through, uh, though our efforts and collaboration with partners, we hope to achieve these specific objectives and contribute to uh, the sustainable integration of refugees into our higher education institutions and society at large. In our Agile project, we have the honor of collaborating with distinguished uh, partners from various Europe European countries. Our partners are recognized leaders in the fields of higher education, research, and social innovation development. And I also have an honor uh, of introducing our invited speakers. Uh, today, um, we are honored to welcome Professor Celia Mella Pfeiffer and uh, Franziska Gerers from the University of Hamburg, Germany, as our esteemed speakers. And um, Professor Sylvia Mello Pfeiffer is a distinguished scholar in the field of foreign language education. Her expertise spans uh, a large uh, uh, spans a range of uh, topics, including online communication, uh, plurilingual and uh, intercultural interaction, intercomprehension in Romance languages, and uh, heritage language education. And Francisca Gervers is a dedicated doctoral student and research assistant at the University of Hamburg, where she is deeply engaged in. Uh, exploring uh, the uh, beliefs of Spanish and French teachers regar uh, regarding language mediation in Germany. And her academic journey is marked uh, by significant involvement in uh, Erasmus Plus projects, names, namely Bold and Agile, of course, and uh, showcasting her commitment uh, to fostering education, educational innovation. So uh, our discussion will center uh, on understanding the complexities of refugee students' self-reported experiences. And we aim to shed light uh, on their journeys, uh, the obstacles they face, and the resilience they demonstrate in uh, pursuing uh, their academic and social integration. And um, we have uh, introduced ourselves and uh, to you. And now we would like to get to know each of you better. So to do this, we suggest following the link you can find uh, in the uh, chat. So please uh, go to the chat and you can find their link to virtual board where you can 
uh, where you can uh, follow and uh, put your name and information about you and your interests uh, during this webinar uh, on your personal sticker. So you can go to the chat, find there the link, and you will be directed to virtual board. You can briefly introduce yourself. Please input your information in the sticker or... I will go with you. And let's look what we have. Yes, we we can see that a lot of you starting to write information and started to put your interest. You can put one question or topic you would like to discuss during the webinar. And uh, after the presentations of our uh, invited speakers, uh, we will have Q&A session and maybe we will have the opportunity to discuss some questions you will write now here. Great. So uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. And now uh, we have a uh, few questions for you during our webinar. So please come back to our Zoom session and uh, we will share with you uh, the first poll with question. So please answer this question and we will see your opinion about, uh, do you believe higher education institutions currently provide sufficient support for the integration of refugee students beyond academic achievement. So let's see, what do you think about this question? Let's wait. few seconds. Okay. So I can share with you results and you see that most of the participants are not sure that uh, higher education institutions currently provide sufficient support for the integration of refugee students. Uh, so uh, let's go to the next step of our webinar. And uh, I'll give the floor to our distinguished uh, speakers, please, Sylvia and Francisca. The floor is yours. Sylvia, you're still muted. Just re realize that uh, so many years of pandemia and still this uh, basic errors. So thank you for being with us. And I would like to start uh, thanking um, uh, web to learn for organizing this uh, webinar and the whole set of webinars in the scope of the Agile project. It's an honor to be here and to present the results of the questionnaire of the Agile project together with Francisca. So thank you for bearing with us. Um, we will present some theoretical ideas on integration in higher education that works and works uh, in inverted commas because we know that one uh, fit alls approach is probably not the best solution for integrating all the diversity of refugees in all the diversity of institutions in higher education. But we will present some common strengths um, that, well, in the literature, at, at least, it works. We will then uh, present some, some further information on the Agile project 
And then I will pass over to Francisca, who will present the data of the large scale survey developed in the in the scope of the agile project i will then in a in a fourth moment focus on the students answering the questionnaire for germany and then we will provide some uh, questions uh, some some conclusions um give you an idea of the next steps of the project how we are disseminating the results and we hope all of you want to discuss um the results and your questions with us so Starting with the integration and what it means, um, I brought um, a quotation from the, from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees showing how important this theme is, the theme that is addressed by the Agile Project. Because according to the United Nations, just only percent of refugee students are enrolled in higher education. And this compares to 34% around the world. So this is a timely question. This is very important because we know that education and higher education more specifically are the keys to, uh, to break the, the, the path, the, the, the issues of discrimination, accessing and participating in, in, in democratic societies, developing citizenship. So it's really very important to address issues and to, oh, really to think about why only this 1% of refugee students are enrolled in higher education. So in the Agile project, we really want to delve into this question. Um, so um, one first answer uh, is also provided by the UNESCO that states that opportunities for refugees to join higher education are very limited. And it's not just the opportunities that are limited, but students with a refugee background face some barriers for entry in higher education institution, such as the missing qualifications, and I'm not saying that they are not qualified. What happens is that sometimes they were subjected to the um, to interruption in their career path. They were subjected to interruption because of war uh, in their in their in their career development, and this might lead to some. To, to some uh, problems in the qualification and evaluation of credentials. Sometimes they also have, when they, when they, they install in a host country, they have limited language proficiency um, in the language of the host country, or they might find uh, information barriers. Um, the education is also not immediately available in terms of finances because uh, some students might face financial problems and, um, well, not to speak of legislative challenges, racism that might occur in different countries, and of course, the insecurity on the status. Do they become a refugee status or not? Do they have to remove or emigrate? So this is also a very, um, a very important problem and some of the of the issues that refugee students face in their path. Um, and then, okay, institutions may open up um, new studies, new courses, but they don't always follow up or evaluate the programs that they create for this specific board. So what I wanted to stress here is that welcoming refugee students as an urgent measure to cope with, um, with their situations is not enough because integration should also cover follow-up and evaluation of the structures created. And last but not least, I want to point something that we sometimes forget. And that's integration. It's not just a product depending only on the student. Integration is a two-way process. It's someone wanted to integrate and it has to do with the measures to welcome the students. It's a dialogical process. 
And it's not depending only on the students, but also on the host society, the host institutions, and well, the context um, at large. Um, another point, and then um, I will pass to the to the presentation of the Agile project, is that integration in higher education is not just integration in higher education. And I will explain why. It's not just about being enrolled in a program in higher education, because it depends. It's not just taking language courses. It has different layers of meaning. So at the micro level, you can, well, be part of different particular initiatives. You can attend some courses at the university, but this is not enough to ensure integration. You may also have to think of integration at the meso level, at the institutional level, will with welcome uh, structures and follow-up structures um, to see and perceive and evaluate how integration uh, occurs. And then it is also not enough to just think of the courses at the institutional level, because you have to think of the society at, at large, um, the, the, the political environment, uh, the demographic environment, how the society and the country are leading with welcoming refugee students and refugee population more at large. And you have to think as well of the relationships that the institutions that you are attending also connect to other institutions outside the academy, academia. So it's really a very holistic, complex process. And that's why we uh, refer to this holistic perspective um, as a whole university approach that covers the curricular stuff at the micro level, but also extracurricular activities aimed at students and communities. So integration means not just involving refugee students in the activities of the university, but also involving the community at large in welcoming the students themselves. So um, moving on to the Agile project. So it was born from uh, or in a moment where we lived several waves um, of, of refugees in Europe, um, waves in a positive sense is not that um, uh, Sometimes waves is uh, not well connoted, but it's it has to do with a, a, a big amount of students coming to Europe. Um, I don't need to go through all the facts um, mentioned here, but several wars, several uh, situations, several in different countries uh, made us come here. And you, we noticed that uh, the institutions um, were still coping to face the number of students coming, despite in the past having went having gone through these situations because of other urgent contexts. So what we saw is that there was some lack of processes in higher education for welcoming refugee students, a sort of institutional institutional amnesia, um, because it always seems that we are starting all over again and not learning from past situations. And we wanted to see how to create resilience in higher education institutions so that we could foster, we can move on and not always starting by planifying new measures for welcoming students. The project um, will last from December 22 to May 25. And um, yeah, our main goal, as Katarina already explained, is really to forge social inclusion through capacity building, civic engagement, and skills recognitions. And now I will present what we have for what we mean um, uh, with the agile process, what we want to achieve. Um, we will have we will implement several interventions in the partner universities. Um, we will see how the communication between academia and society can, can promote resilience, um, and we will disseminate our events. 
uh, namely in a, in a summer school this year, this year. So uh, we will come back to this issue later. And now uh, Francisca will present the landscape analysis of higher education crisis support mechanisms for refugee students, namely by presenting the large scale survey on the sociolinguistic and academic integration of graduate students with a refugee background. So uh, sometimes my mouse don't obey me. So Francisca, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. So I think we have the next poll before I start, actually. So we have another question from other participants. Please click on your answer and we will see the results. What do you think about which aspect of integration should higher education institutions prioritize for refugee students? So, we see that most of participants thought uh, that uh, it must be social integration. So, let's Go to the next poll. What is the biggest challenge refugee students face in integrating into academic life? What do you think about this question? Oh, it's very interesting. I'll share results. No one point culture differences. It's very interesting. We see language barriers, financial difficulties, difficulties at first place, and lack of social support, some academic uh, preparedness. So let's go to the presentation of our speaker and I, I think we will find some answers to this question. Yes, thank you. That's very interesting to see and compare with the results that we got from our skirt survey, I think. So uh, I will talk about the large scale survey that we conducted within the Agile project. Um, we implemented a survey on the sociolinguistic and academic integration of graduate students with a refugee background. So within our Agile consortium, we designed a questionnaire that we uh, piloted that we discussed a lot in order to have a holistic view of how um, refugee students could integrate or are integrated into the higher education system, the different systems that we have within our project. Um, so we collaboratively designed the questionnaire and then implemented it online. Um, and uh, for the, then we disseminated it uh, via our um, different channels. So via our universities, via social media, and I think also some, some more personal um, contacts and everything, and some organizations as well that are implemented within the universities that uh, deal with refugee students or help refugee students integrate. Um, so we implemented it online. You can see some screenshots from how it looked. Um, we <clears throat> translated the questionnaire to, I'm sorry, um, to a different, partner languages so you can see that the the students were able to choose the language they wanted to fill out the questionnaire in because we thought well some might not be fluent in English uh, if they for example come from Ukraine to or from Syria to Germany they might be more fluent in German than in English so that's why we let them choose which language they could fill out the questionnaire in um <clears throat> Yes, and we got 160 answers in total. So 160 students filled in a questionnaire and they were from uh, different host countries. Uh, so from France, Poland, Germany, Slovenia, Lithuania, Italy, and Ukraine. Um, could you go to the next slide? So I will present the results according to the 
different parts of the questionnaire that we had. So the first part of the questionnaire was about the personal background and academic background of the students, um, where we asked them, for example, what languages they used uh, daily. <clears throat> and 73% of the students said that they used three or more languages daily. So uh, we asked which languages that were, and it was, of course, the language of the home country, then the language of the host country, and most of them also used English in their daily lives. So at least three languages, some also used more. Um, <clears throat> then we asked about their high school um, and way um, and asked where they finished high school. And most of them already finished high school in their host con uh, home countries. Uh, just 4% finished it in the host countries. So most of them already had their high school certificate which we were interested in knowing if it was accepted in the host country. So if they could continue with higher education without any problems, which 73% of them could, but there were still some who couldn't. So 8%, 13 of the students, of the 160 students had not had their high school diploma accepted in the host country. Um, and the reasons were that either it was not needed, so they didn't want to continue with higher education, or they didn't need the certificate, or there were bad political relations between the countries, or there was a translation needed that they did not have, or that the diploma was just not available if they had left it in the home country, for example. Um, and then we also asked if the students already studied at a university before coming to the host country, at the home country, and 64% of them did, so quite a lot. Um, so then when coming to the uh, host country, of course, we were interested in how they started their academic or higher education careers in the host country. And uh, we asked if they first took language courses and 71% um, of them did. So the majority of the students coming to the host countries first took a language course before uh, or when enrolling at the university. And they arrived with very diverse uh, language levels. So the range was from no prior knowledge in the host language to C2 level, so fluent uh, speaking. And half of the students decided to take, uh, uh, I'm sorry, half of the students decided to take language courses, and 71% said that they already had a sufficient language to follow courses. That's, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So half of the students, uh, even though 71% said that they already had a sufficient language level, 50% still said they wanted to take a language course in order to improve. Um, and we also asked what the required level for the en enrolling in academic courses was. Uh, and there were very diverse answers. A lot of students also didn't know which level was required. Um, but I think for the majority of the students, it was uh, for 54%, it was B2 levels. So like, a, fluent but not mother tongue level. Um, and out of the 80 people, so only half of the people knew uh, what language level they had after the course, uh, after the language course, and only 39% had reached that B2 level. So only half of the people that took the language course that knew of it, of the level, re actually reached the level that they needed. Um, so after taking the language courses, of course, we were interested in what support they were offered from the university, which we already saw in the polls that it's interesting to see what you think is important. Um, so we asked them what they actually used and what they think they need. Um, so the most students universities offered uh, support for foreign students in general and refugee students in particular. So only 3% of the students said that there was no support at all from the university. So that's good already that most people have support. Um, and then the most commonly offered support was uh, the language courses that we already saw a little bit, then the financial support, which we already saw before that we think it's important. Um, so I think those were the two points in the poll that you voted for most, which is nice to see <laughs> that it uh, is congruent. Um, then of course, administrative help with the registering and everything, academic counseling, um, additional courses and tutoring and psychological counseling was also very important. So those were the most commonly offered supports. And then 64% of the students indicated that they used some kind of that support. Um, and as we can see on the right in the, in the pie chart, uh, about half of the students said that they would actually like more support so that it's not sufficient yet. Um, 
So after asking them about the support systems, we also asked about the academic courses that they take. Um, and around 62% of the students are currently or were currently taking while taking, and sorry, the questionnaire were taking academic courses at the universities. Um, the rest of them were either already finished or were still preparing for taking language, uh, for taking academic courses by, for example, taking a language course. Um, and as we can see in the uh, bar chart below, that uh, the majority or 84 of the students are currently working on the bachelor degree. So about half of them are in the bachelor's and then there's some in the master degree, very few uh, doing working on a PhD and some that are not yet uh, in academic, enrolled in academic courses. So we also were interested in knowing if of the people who studied in their home country before coming to a host country, if they changed the subject or if they continued the same studies. And we saw that uh, about a fourth of the students uh, that already are taking academic courses changed the subject. Um, so the reasons they gave why they changed it was the change for career prospects, the change prior priorities, which makes sense if you think about it, that your interests and priorities change when having, having to change a country. <laughs> and then um, new or different subjects are available or accessible. And of course, the course language was also important as some courses were given in English that they could maybe follow while they could not follow the language of the whole home country. Um, <clears throat> for the course languages and the language for communication with the professors, we saw that it was mainly the language of the host country that people used. So for the course language, it was 54% for the communication with professors, 61% of the students used the host country language. But English was also very important as 43% of the courses went, had English courses and 46 of the students indicated that they also used English with their professors. Um, for the communication with peers, uh, it was interesting to see, of course, also the language of the host country and English were important, but also other languages became more important compared to the course or language of communication with professors. So um, third languages like Russian, Ukrainian or Turkish were also used a lot. Um, yes. So the last part of the questionnaire was around general, about general feedback from the students. Um, so we asked them if they would be willing to help uh, other students in exile or refugee students in the future, which 77% of the students asked uh, did want to help, which is nice to know that we have some support, some more support available, obviously. Um, and then in an open question, we asked what uh, form of support that could, uh, what things help them most with integrating into the higher education system. And uh, they indicated things like peer support and uh, support from professors and university staff. So staff, so the social element was uh, very important also with the family support. And then of course, uh, open-mindedness and communication, which I would compare to the cultural element, which no one indicated before in the poll, which is interesting that the students uh, think that is very important actually, and that helped them. And then the main challenges were of course, the language barrier because some courses were just not accessible the different culture, administrative issues, loneliness and stress. So again, the psychological, social dimension and cultural dimension. <clears throat> and I think that was it from the general part. And now Sylvia will focus on the, the German students that we asked. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much, Francisca. And um, it's important to say, first of all, that our data for Germany are not representative because we had six students only answering the questions, um, but still it's important to see that even if the pool of students, it's it's a small cohort, it's, uh, it is still um, coherent with the broader data that Francisca presented, but with some specificities that are uh, that are related to Germany and studying in Germany. So we had six participants, all plurilingual with a use of languages ranging from two to seven languages in a daily basis um, and all use German on a daily basis. So sometimes we hear that uh, refugees or e even migrants at large do not want to use the language of the host country, bollocks. So we see here that 
people integrating our society, the higher education, they commit to use the language of the host country as well, and this in a daily basis, to communicate and to learn. Three finished high school in the host country and three in the own country, um, and three decided, uh, 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 revealed that their diplomas were accepted, but two have to provide uh, further requirements, and one was not accepted or recognized at all in the field of healthcare and medicine. So uh, we have to think about this in Germany as the as um, everybody sees and says that we have a lack of people working on these domains. And if we make the recognition of skills difficult, well, we, we know where it's leading. And three students already studied in their own countries. So six, five and three years already in higher education, and they already had a degree, but because of they had difficulties in recognition, uh, they had to start over. So this is something that should make our institutions reflect about how to deal with the recognition of skills. And this is why Agile is so important at this point. So what we see is a very heterogeneous profile in terms of linguistic competences, in terms of previous academic path, and even in terms of what kind of experiences did they make in terms of recognition of skills. Um, what we also can see, and it's interesting to read Paul Francisca's data, is that they present a very disparate answers on the level, the linguistic level that is needed at the at German universities, from C2 to B2 and to, I don't even know. So um, it's interesting to see that even in the same country, and not all students were from Hamburg, but we can see that the, the, the information doesn't seem to be coherent across all the contexts, or even because the, uh, the, um, the different career paths studies may ask for different levels of German. Um, two out of six do not know if their university supports uh, foreign students and students in exile in particular. So the information is not flowing everywhere at the same pace and with the same level of accuracy. Um, and what is important to see is that amongst the programs, the support programs that the students quote in their answers are the welcome programs before beginning studies. And if students recall this program is because they were important or deemed important to start studying because they convey the first information. And then three students uh, refer to the support throughout to the entire study program. So the following up that I refer to during the presentation of the theory. And very interesting is just one student mentioned support at the end of the studies, like for finding a job. And this is where we see that not all phases of academic integration are present equally in all institutions. So at this phase, the, the support at the end of the studies is not referred or not widely, widely referred to. What might then hinder the integration or the transition from higher education to the job market? So this is something that institutions probably could focus more in the future after welcoming the students, helping them to integrate in society at large. So again, we see a very heterogeneous knowledge of support mechanisms offered and the conditions to attend higher education. Um, among the support, only 3% make use of them. So it's almost uh, the data that Francisca presented at the large survey it was 64%. In this small cohort is 50%. But um, they are, the students censoring are quite bold saying what they miss as support and what they need. So for example, one student says uh, that useful was helping with legal advice for refugee students and giving them a lot of support by helping with flat or job search research programs. And we know, for example, from, from Hamburg that really searching for housing and accommodation is really a big issue. 
Besides that, it is good to know that you can ask your tutor from administrative department when you have any issue. Exchange is also important. And what we see from the offer that is available and the offer that they think should be available, there are some mismatches. And for example, five students declared needing more support and they refer to special places for regular studying programs for refugees. Um, the idea that they need a safe space to interact, a community was also mentioned and the cooperation between universities in the host and the own um, countries. In terms of interaction at university, uh, students rarely report contact with peers and professors for asking for linguistic content related or administrative advices. And student associate associations from the same um, home country are little known and are not really perceived as a resource. And mainly regarding the first point, I was, or we were discussing is if this is a sense of isolation and being on their own because they don't uh, they don't really report using this kind of interaction possibilities with peers and professors or and this is another possibility is that these students went through so many uh, issues in their lives that they developed some kind of enhanced agency and autonomy to be by their own and they think and they they sort out, out uh, solve their the problem. So it's difficult by the answers to see if this is isolation or autonomy and agency in coping with the situations. About studying in Germany, there are several aspects uh, mentioned by our students. And I would just like to cluster them around three aspects. The first one is the positive career prospects that they mentioned. Um, they always they they see um, they see a, a, a future a professional future after they they went through the university. The low fees of enrolling at university in Germany and the quality of education that they qualify as high. What helps the most, and this again matches Francisca's results is the linguistic knowledge. And then something that we don't focus that much in our research, the informal interactions with peers, with friends, with other mates. They consistently refer to this interaction with peers in developing their linguistic knowledge and developing their understanding of the institution uh, in the host country. What they miss the most, apart from the food, as you see among the answers provided, is again, because they think it helps the most, what they also miss the most are informal interactions, more occasions for interaction with peers, uh, with like-minded peers. Um, they also refer that um, they miss some aspects of academic life in the own country, because it's a new academic model, they are in a new academic culture, and they uh, they feel that they, they they miss some of these aspects aspects of the young country, and they also miss being uh, uh, studying in other languages. So in Germany, they they quote more English or more uh, German, but they miss the other languages they were used to study in in their own, uh, own countries. The main challenges, you they, they match what you answer in the poll, linguistic knowledge, the new academic culture, and the changes in the career paths, because some have to change and kind of completely forget what they were doing before arriving to Germany. Uh, so to close up with the presentation, I know Katerina was about to kill me, um, the, we can see that it's not just at the macro level that integration works, it's not just the meso level, it's not the micro level, it's really the, the holistic integration 
and the combination of bottom-up and top-down policies and initiatives. So to be more concrete, at the macro level, the students refer to connection to job market, market connection to student and associations, and to the connections between host and own universities. At the meso level, they refer the lack or the need for more accessible information, more occasions for interaction among peers and, and with students in the same conditions. And at the micro level, of course, classes in other languages, more information on teaching styles and what they should provide as academic performance and specific information on evaluation because evaluation is always at the core of pre preoccupations in higher education, what you achieve. In the future, we will participate in other seminar series. We will have a summer school in Bordeaux and we will generate more information, more guidelines to help institutions to build up their resilience to cope with situations. If, if you want to follow us, here are our channels. And the literature is not that important at this phase. We just say vielen Dank. Thank you for our attention. Or in Portuguese, muito obrigado. Thank you. Dankeschön.